This is It's On You, part two, asking the question of who is my neighbor. We'll look at Luke 10, 29. The man who asked Jesus, how do I do it? When Jesus began to explain, this man, wanting to justify himself, the scripture says, looked at Jesus and said, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Last week, we, we asked a question, and this question was, what do we do with Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone? What do you do when it's not possible to live at peace with everyone? What do you do when there's no acceptable middle ground? What do we as Bible-believing Christians do? If you're following along inside your book, I, I, I had a short, uh, inside your bullets, and I had a short survey this week, and uh, I have kind of redid the, the follow-up sheets for you. Uh, they are a little more in-depth, they're a little bigger, and the answer key has returned. Ah, he listened, okay. So um, follow along with me if you would, and let's talk about this for a minute. What are we supposed to do if we can't find common ground with someone who disagrees with us. Well, Christ told us that we are to be peacemakers. That's what Matthew 5, 9 says. A peacemaker understands that there are times that you have to fight. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 says there's a time and a place for everything. In verse 8 it says... There's a time for war and a time for peace. Last week we talked about Jude chapter 1, 3, and 4, and it told us that we are to earnestly contend for matters of faith. Earnestly contend is not given 10%. Earnestly contend is like the commercial, you're giving 110%. In fact, it goes so far that in the Greek, this picture of earnest contention is fighters in the ring. It's realizing that one person is going to walk out of that ring alive, and the other one is not. So we are to fight, earnestly contending for matters of faith. We are to fight as if we were an armed combatant. The context is that the author is encouraging us to fight against the infiltration of worldly norms into the church. Worldly norms, cultural norms, do not necessarily and often just plain don't, don't find themselves or should not find themselves in the church. We have got to keep worldly thinking outside of our doctrine. And so that's what we are to earnestly contend for. I am talking to you today, it's going to have a political tone to it, and you might be like, well, you know, Aaron, if it's about politics, faith doesn't belong in politics. Well, if you believe that, hear me lovingly, that kind of thinking is part of the problem. Okay? And here's the reason why. People want to argue separation of church and state. Well, you need to understand that separation of church and state is a founding ideal not to keep the church from influencing the state. It was to keep the state from influencing the church. And to put it in the right context, understand that there are all these kings and queens that believed that they were made king and queen by God's divine providence. Hence, because God has put them into their rule, they should be able to dictate matters of religion. And our early Christian forefathers who came across from England and from Europe, they kind of said, no, no. We have to keep the state out of the church. And so they came to America and they built a culture based on keeping the state out of the church. I want to affirm to you today that nowhere was it intended 
that the church should be silent on matters of state. I want you to consider for me today. There were 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Of those 56 signers, 29 of them went to schools that we would say today are the equivalent of Bible schools. They went to schools, not necessarily to be preachers, but they went to schools that had a strong Christian presentation. That these men, when they left these schools, maybe they were better than some of today's preachers. But 29 of them went to schools like Harvard and Yale. And if you're like, well, those are Ivy League schools, Aaron. Those might as well be the devil's armpit. Understand what I'm saying, okay? Now they have become what they've become. But when they were started, they were started for the purpose of bringing the gospel to America. 29 of them went to those schools. Four of them eventually became pastors. 55 of 56, and I checked this on several resources, 55 of 56 identified themselves as Protestants and actually were regular members of their church. Now, if it was intended that the church not influence the state. Why would those numbers be so high? I'll go a little further. What I can say to you today with relative confidence, what I can't say is that the United States was founded to be a Christian nation. I can't say that. All right? What I can say is that it was established under the influence of Christian people. People who let their faith influence their politics. People who were influenced by pastors and church leaders speaking in church services about matters of faith and politics. These were people who let the Bible govern their thinking regarding community, regarding law, regarding country. And this went on through 1894. And in 1894, what occurred was that the government made a formal proclamation that all church properties are now tax-exempt. And you would think that's a great thing. This was already happening previously, but now they codified it. And that went on until 1954, when under the influence of Lyndon Baines Johnson, they added just this little tiny piece to this called the 501c3 status. And in the 501c3 status, part of this, part of this 501c3 status is the premise that a person or an organization that falls into 501c3 cannot be political. And so they're saying 501c3 status, you're not allowed to talk about matters of politics. In fact, to be very clear, they say you can't be partisan. So in other words, I can't stand up here and be like pro-Democrat or pro-Republican. But that doesn't mean I can't tell you what the Bible says about matters of politics today. So people, they heard this. They heard that politics doesn't belong in the church because of the 501c3. And now here we are 70 years later and people have said to me, don't talk about that. Don't, don't be political. Uh, and, and this thought has invaded our popular thinking. Now it's prevailing logic. If I have them in a room with 10 pastors, most of them would say to me that they're under pressure not to talk about political things. And the funny thing is the same people who tell them don't talk about political things tell them focus on teaching us God's word so we can make better decisions. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? You see, the problem is our politics are based on what we use to frame our daily decisions. Hello? Okay. As believers, we frame our daily decisions through the truth of God's word. We're making the decisions we need to make by understanding and studying the Bible. So how do we divorce our political views 
from what and how we've been taught. Let me go a little further. I don't think we can divorce the two. And I think to try to argue that we should makes us very inconsistent people. Thus, I believe that we need preaching to continue the discussions that we're hearing over the media on a consistent basis. We need a growing understanding of the Bible when we consider, how do we vote? What do we think? How does this all apply? And so doing that, this is why I'm doing this today. I'm doing my job. That being said, my goal is two-pronged, and this is my goal for every sermon I ever preach. I want you walking out of here with one of two different conclusions. One conclusion is, you know, I never thought about it like that before, which is good. I like that. I like to spur thinking. And it may kind of come off kind of sideways to you, but I'm actually okay with this too. I'm okay with somebody leaving here going, I do not agree with what he says. And then going home, getting in your Bible and studying it and find out if you're right or you're not. You see, one of the things I've shared with you of me behind this pulpit is that I do my best to study God's Word and to bring it to your attention. But I could be wrong. I'm frequently wrong about a lot of things. And our part together is to grow together, which means you can't stand before God one day and go, well, Aaron told me that. You're ultimately responsible to study the Word and prove it for yourself. Now, my goal and my hope is that I hear from God correctly, but I'm a human being. And so don't take my Word as law. Take it to the Scripture and see if it's true. Either way, I feel like my mission is accomplished. Whether you agree or you're like, we're fighting. Either way, I think that I've done the right thing. I talked last week about four topics that I wanted to bring to your attention between last week's sermon and this week's sermon. And I realized after I said that, there is no way that I can get that done. And so I studied it a little more and I prayed about it a little more and I came to a conclusion that really opened my eyes. We were going to talk about abortion, which we did last week. We were going to talk about human sexuality. We were going to talk about debt and going to talk about illegal immigration. But, you know, as I studied these things, I grew to understand that that abortion and human sexuality and illegal immigration, they're not simply an issue of let's fight about political differences. What it ultimately comes down to is that these fights center around the biblical position that we are made in the image of God. Thus, we need to address those things through the framework. And what separates team light from team darkness is not a separation of a classification of political party. It's not about Republicans good, Democrats bad, or vice versa. It's the separation, what separates light from darkness in our thinking is the separation of people who choose accountability to the Scripture and people who don't. People who say, I'm going to trust God's Word for answers on this, and people who are going to fight His influence. This is why Paul wrote to Timothy and said in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, for all Scripture is God-breathed. Take it. It's God-breathed. It's meant for us, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And here's the key, that the man or or, or the servant of God may be equipped for every good work. May be equipped, ladies and gentlemen, to discern God's will in your vote. You see, the Bible teaches us to defend human life as human life is made in the image of God. The Bible teaches us of God's plan for human sexuality as an expression of the image of God. I believe the Bible shows us that when God created man and woman, he took himself and cut his characteristics in half. And he gave half of those characteristics to man 
and gave half of those characteristics to women so that when they come together in the sexual expression, what they are doing is each bringing their half to create a new whole. And this is why two genders is important. This is why marriage being defined as between a husband and a wife is important. It comes down to the arguments that we are made in the image of God. Regarding immigrants, we believe abortion is wrong because babies are made in the image of God. Regarding human sexuality, we believe God has a plan for human sexuality that reproduces the image of God. Regarding immigrants, I think it's important that we understand that all humanity is valued by God. And as believers, all humanity should be valued by us. Which means, to go back to that Sunday school song, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now, either that's true or it's not. And I think we have to stand secure that every human being has been created in the image of God. I want to show you something because I found this very interesting. I think you guys know me well enough that I'm not going to sit up here and spout a bunch of opinions. I'm going to do some research, and I'm going to show you what I found on this issue of illegal immigration. And I'm showing you this because I believe that one of the things we witness in just about every presidential campaign is the dehumanizing and demonization of somebody. And usually speaking, and I grew up, look, let me, let me qualify my credentials here. I listened to Rush Limbaugh from the beginning, okay? This was somebody who had, I mean, I remember working with my dad as a boy, and this is what was on all the time. And so I was schooled to be as conservative as you can be. And that's just one example, but follow me on this for a moment. But as I've watched how politics has worked out, there almost always is a dehumanization and demonization of somebody. The Democrats do it and the Republicans do it. And how they do this oftentimes is they take statistics and they twist them to their advantage. And so I'm going to show you some uncomfortable statistics here that I'd like you to consider. And this graph is based upon what we call border um, border Patrol Migrant Encounters. And so let me define terms for you of what this means. This means that this is an illegal immigrant that the Border Patrol has encountered, incarcerated, and taken note on. Okay? So, several years ago, I heard a commentator talking about what they called replacement theory. And that piqued my interest, because I'm thinking, what are we replacing? And the idea was, was that the Democratic Party was very interested in open borders for the purpose of sending people to cities because when they got them to cities, they would continue to promote the Democratic agenda in those cities. And ultimately, if they could go and get them into the country then they could, when the Democrats were in power, they could make legislation that would allow these people to be citizens so that they would vote for the Democrats. This is replacement theory, all right? So it has two objectives. More population in Democrat-run areas to give more seats in government to Democrats. And the second was eventual voting rights from which would keep Democrats perpetually in power. Now, According to this graph, um, over 1.6 million illegal immigrants encountered were encountered in 1986. That's by the blue arrow. This may be hard to discern, but the blue arrow is 1986. Now again, my upbringing said Democrats want this, and so they will open the borders. Guess who was president in 1986? Ronald Reagan. Let me go a little further. If you can see by the pink arrow there, that is 2001. Once again, 
1.6 million migrant encounters. Guess who was president in 2001? George W. Bush. Wait, that's not supposed to be, right? Because Democrats were supposed to be the ones that constantly allowed for illegal immigrants. So now we see by the red arrow, and I think that you have to be blind not to see this, that the immigration system is a muck right now. And you can see how many millions more encounters are occurring under the Biden administration and that's something that we have to take into consideration. But what was very eye-opening to me in the midst of studying this graph is, again, I thought, because it's what I had heard, that this was something that was a Democrat problem. And while it's true, if you look at the graph over the Clinton administration, you'll see they had more illegal immigrants coming into the country over those eight years than anywhere else, okay? So you look at that and you go, well, that's, that's really interesting. So that should prove the thought of replacement theory, right, Aaron? Well, no, see, because do you see uh, after the red arrow that sharp decline and it gets real small, that real dip down there in the bottom? Guess who was president during the least amount of illegal immigrants crossing into the United States? It wasn't Trump. It was Barack Obama. Now, hold on a second. How's that work? You see, after all, I have been told that illegal immigration was a Democratic issue, so how is it that the poster boy for the Democratic Party would somehow change the rules so that under his administration is the least amount of, of, of Border Patrol migrant encounters? Well, this just might be an example of how tactics of diminishing and dehumanization have been used to secure our votes. Let me go on. I want to talk to you for a minute about this fact, too. That we as Christians have dual citizenship. And when you think about that dual citizenship, I want, you to remind, I want to remind you that the Bible clearly says that we are citizens of heaven first. And then we are citizens on earth. And which, what I believe that means is that means we have to take into consideration our citizenship, our heavenly citizenship, as we think about how we live here in this world. Now, look at this verse as we contrast heavenly citizenship and earthly citizenship, and it's Philippians chapter 3, 18 through 21. It says, For as I have been told, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even through tears, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Keep that in mind. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we earnestly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under control will transform our lowly bodies so that they may be like his heavenly body. Now, let's get to the brass tacks on this. There is a tension. We walk a proverbial minefield as we navigate what it is to be allegiant to a political platform. We are citizens of America. And Paul tells us in Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the higher power, for the powers that be are ordained of God. Yet we are first citizens of heaven, not because of where we were born, but because we have accepted the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Folks, that decision is not offered only to Democrats. It's not offered only to Republicans. It's not offered to white people at the expense of minorities. Citizenship in heaven is offered to everyone who is part of of the family of God. Thus, when we think that we should be thinking about our heavenly citizenship first, should we look out as the family of God for fellow citizens of heaven who need our help and our benefit? I wonder. I think as Christians, we are obligated to look beyond American interests and see to our heavenly interests. I think so much 
So that, that I want to throw this out to you, and I want you to mull this thing over for a minute. We need to consider that there is a human being created in God's interest behind the act of illegal immigration. There's human beings that are filled with needs. They bring families. They are desperate enough to try to enter America as dangerous as it potentially is for them. Human beings that are victims of, of poor national policy, both in their country and also in our, our country. Human beings that are being exploited by political rhetoric and fear. Human beings that need leaders to avoid stereotyping and fear-mongering for the sins of the few. You see, that type of talk has consequences. This is my 27th year as a pastor. And one of the things that has made me grieve, and I don't use that word very often, but I have, I have had a couple instances where I just grieved. It's been when fear has been the basis of church policy. When fear says that we have to diminish or dehumanize at minimum what we don't understand. At its extreme, what I've seen reflected more than once, probably more than 10 times, is the idea that, um, well, I'll put it to you this way. It's the idea that white people are better than anyone else. Let me give you an example of how I've heard that. Someone said to me, Pastor, you get more of those darkies. I'm afraid that where I'm going to put my purse down. Another one said, what's going to happen when their boys go after our girls? In another place, the church board said this to us. I was not on staff. I was a missionary from Bible school this year, they said, we can't have this event because those project people are going to destroy our bathrooms. Three quotes about how the church has responded in fear. So I'm telling you that I grieve when fear is the basis for church policy. I grieve when I think that we as the majority people are looking at the minority going, we're better than they are. I can tell you in my career, I've seen that that was the attitude of some leaders. Now, before I go on, I want to define terms for you here for a minute. To say that someone is diminished is to say that they are made less than me, okay? It is a tactic of belittling the person for their position. We're not going after the position. See, we would do a whole lot better if we simply would say, let's, let's have a discussion on our differences. But you see, too many times, the way that Satan divides is he has us going after people, not position. And so to diminish them is to say, well, you don't have a college education. What do you know? You see where I'm going? All right, let's go a little further. Demonizing someone is a tactic of fear that says that these people are responsible for what's wrong in the world today. What's wrong going around me? So here's what we need to do with these people. Let's just get rid of them. Let's get them as far away from us as they can. And again, it's not because we disagree. It's done by design to divide and conquer. So let me reiterate. Each of these things is a strategic move often to advance an agenda without the whole truth. And why? Because of the late 2000s, there was a shift in what was perceived as leadership. You see, leadership used to be, I can reach across the aisle. I can find common ground. We can go somewhere together. Now leadership is, if there's more of us than there are of them, we can dictate terms. We can tell everybody what we want them to do. And because there's more of us than them, they have to do it. And folks, I would say that's not leadership. I would say that's fracturing us as a people. 
and it's being strategically done because fractured people are easier to manipulate. And when you think of politics, what do you see politics as but often synonymous with manipulation? So again, let me be very specific. You have one party calling the voters of another party garbage. You have another party saying that illegal immigrants are invaders and animals. Why do they have to go this path to get our support? I think the truth, if it really is true, should be able to stand on its own two feet. And so I've bantered this around, and the general response that I've been getting from people as we've talked about this is that's just politics, Aaron. That's just what it is. It's going to be over soon. But I want to say to you this morning that we Christians have a higher calling than this. And I want to advocate that the church practice a better Christianity than simply regurgitating divisive rhetoric I want to advocate that the church go further than to be willing participants to political posturing done by either party. I want to put in front of you, what does Jesus think about his church built on the sacrifice of sin and grace for the sinner being part of this? I would point you to 1 Peter 4.17. It says, for the time has come for judgment and it must begin with God's house. And so if I could say it this way, judgment begins in the house of God. Look, we can expect sinners to act like sinners. But when the family of God starts acting like sinners, we need to watch out because God is not going to let his church live in that place. Correction is going to come. And part of that correction is to remember that we are citizens of heaven first. So to point us to Scripture again a little further, who is our neighbor? I think there's a lot of wisdom to be found in the story of the Good Samaritan. So let's ask, as a believer, who is our neighbor and what is the role? Luke 10, 29, again, Jesus fields that question, who is my neighbor? And he tells the story of a man who goes from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way, he is beaten, he is robbed, and he's left for dead. The first man walks by and he sees the tragedy and even though the law compelled him to do something, he walked by. He said, I can't get involved in this because it's too great of an inconvenience. The second man walked by, repeated the exact same thing. I can't get involved in what I see because it's too big of an inconvenience. It'll cost me too much. These two people... They were that injured man's own people. They were obligated by law, but they didn't follow it. But the final man comes by, and he's a foreigner. And this man who's a foreigner is not just a foreigner. He's the guy who had been diminished and demonized by the Jewish people. He's a Samaritan. These people, they were to the Jews the reminder of one of the worst seasons of their history. This man sees the tragedy. And he doesn't go, that man hates me. I'm not doing anything about it. This man sees the tragedy of that Jewish man beaten bloody and left for dead. And the Bible says he had compassion on him. He had compassion. The man wasn't obligated. He simply recognized the human need and responded as one human being choosing to love the other. So let's bring it into today's context. I want to offer you that the foreigner in the story is acting more like a citizen of heaven. I want to offer to you that he sees the human need. He sees a human being made in the image of God and reacts with compassion. I want to offer you the first two. They ignored the situation based upon their own selfish ambition. They didn't take into consideration the human need. And they saw how it would inconvenience them. And as I read this story, I think to myself that the church needs to act more like the Samaritan in this case. And less like the Jews. More to recognize that there is a human need behind illegal immigration. And less like politicians who diminish and demonize people, inspiring fear and a desire to simply get rid of the problem. So how do we do that? Let's talk about what we can't do. Folks, we can't promote lawlessness. 
and I want to say that again because I'm sure that there are those of you who have been listening to this. Is Pastor Aaron for open borders? He is not, okay? That's not at all what I'm saying. And I'm saying this to you again. We cannot promote lawlessness. The solution to this is not more broken laws. Let me go further. We cannot allow rhetoric to become our truth. The best way I would express this to you is that we have to keep in mind that these are human beings made in the image of God, and we have to address that accordingly. But thirdly, we can't allow being American to be more important than being Christian. So let me tell you what we can do. We can remember that these people are made in God's image and protect them. We can protect them by how we talk about the situation, by how we speak and by how we act. We can love them by being the hands of Jesus to them. And I'll tell you where this really got me, and I'll be quick. About seven years ago, the Free Methodist Church joined in an alliance of other churches offering immigration assistance through the local church. And I went, I don't like that. Well, why not? Well, now we're enabling lawbreakers. That was my view. I'm not so sure it's my view now. Because I think that what we are doing in this, in this situation is we are recognizing that these people are here. And we can help them to become citizens of the United States. Or we can sit here and diminish and demonize them and do nothing And understand while we do that, they're living in houses 20 people deep. Oftentimes, their children um, are living in unsanitary conditions. Uh, it's, It's awful what these folks have to deal with. Now, again, you could be like, they're criminals there. I'm not disagreeing with you. But they're still human beings first. Let me go a little further. We can influence policy for better laws. Here's where I really want to focus this, okay? A lot of times, again, we can act like the two Jews who went beyond the guy who was dying and go, this isn't my problem. But you know what? There was a time that the Free Methodist Church rose up against slavery. And they rose up against slavery because they recognized that these people were made in the image of God, and it is our problem. And I'm proposing to you in this case that we can be people who influence better policy, influence the government actually enforcing law, influence better laws that potentially are framed through more compassion. Does that mean we open up the borders? No, it does not. But does it mean that we take into consideration how to, you, how to address the human need? I believe it does. And then the last part of this is we can use our American citizenship to vote. People? We can't sit this election out. Hello? We cannot sit this election out. There are too many things, too many things that potentially are culturally and country defining for us to go, I don't like her or no orange man for me. We cannot take that approach and be people who I believe, and I believe the scripture teaches us, are in this world, planted here for God's purpose. So I, please consider voting. It's that important. Let me wrap this up. I think a lot of us have come to the conclusion that when we are make this vote on Tuesday that we're not electing a pastor-in-chief, we're electing a president. And what we need from a president is someone who respects the Constitution. Someone who prioritizes to the needs of American citizens. In the Constitution, you'll see that the job of the president is to execute law and to provide for the common defense. That's his job in a nutshell. They represent America in the world, but only to the level that we as American citizens give them the power and the authority. They should not seek to become the president of the world but instead be an influence and an ally to nations who ally with us. 
our president should present the best of America and offer what he can that the freedoms that we have been given will be freedoms that potentially can be embraced in areas that don't have them. They should be in this world, but not of it. Remembering again that their job is not to lead the world, their job is to lead America. And what the president should be, and what we know of either candidate, or what the president, let me try that again, what the president is, what we know of either candidate that we'll vote for on Tuesday, is that they are flawed human beings, and they need our prayer support, but also our willingness to call things out if they're wrong. As citizens of heaven, the only one who gets our allegiance should be Jesus Christ. So the point of this series, it's this. Earnestly contend for truth. I presented some things to you today that you might have just been, this is what you thought. And maybe today, you're challenged a little bit on that. I believe our earnest contention for truth means that we should fight against any place, popular culture, negative rhetoric that influences the church. I believe we should vote as American citizens. I believe we should reserve allegiance to where your faith and your politics agree. And when they don't, pray for change in the hearts of the people who are in power. Because ladies and gentlemen, God is not finished with America. Let's pray.